good afternoon <laughs> uh, whenever i come into a conference like this and it's the fag end of the day it feels a lot like college again you have more back benches and a lot of empty spaces so <laughs> but i hope you you find this session useful uh, and welcome to all the panelists i think the introduction already happened so i won't repeat that uh, just to kick off the the session uh, as an as a as an introduction i think big data as 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 a, as words uh, has probably become more jargonized than anything else that we have today uh, probably even the chana wala today talks of big data <laughs> so there is so much of big data talk that's going on uh, that it has become a bit of a jargon and in fact a few months ago uh, gartner has this concept of a hype cycle where technology which gets hyped uh, occupies the peak uh, of you know of expectations and a few months back they they brought big data down from that peak which is good in a way which means that more and more people are beginning to use big data and that's 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 gratifying but yes it's been it's been hyped up a lot uh, i thought what we could we could begin with is uh, really speaking for all of us as retailers or as businessmen uh, at the end of the day it's the customer experience that matters so how customer centric are we in our business really is the way by which uh, whether you use big data or use other insights uh, that's the end point that you want to get to so to kick off this conversation i would invite shirish uh, shirish just as a quick introduction has spent a lot of time in the consumer goods business started his career with procter and gamble and then with pepsi and yum as well uh, and then the way i look at industries i see that there are some industries which are data rich retail is one of them banking is another and there are some which are data poor on a comparative basis and consumer goods tends to be that uh, i thought shirish if you could come in and tell us a little more about your experience about customer centric and customer insight oriented work and how you pick insight from the data is this audible is the mic on yeah, yeah. okay so good afternoon everyone and uh, Uh, so Ajay gave the introduction. So I'm an electronics engineer who spent many years in consumer marketing, but then moved into telecom, and now in a conglomerate where uh, there's a fair bit of interaction with big data. So what I thought I would share is certainly my journey in terms of, uh, based on not just my organization but my interactions with this whole ecosystem around insights as to what I think is important and uh, and has and makes a difference into effectiveness. to begin with since we're talking about the word insight uh, does anybody want to hazard what makes a good insight or what are the components or hallmarks of a good insight or what is an insight what 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 should we call an insight no one somebody should hazard one no is there a hand somewhere Can you say that again? An insight is something that an insight would be an idea which would crop up immediately by looking at the data, which would give you guidelines how you need to proceed further to grow your business. All right. So that that's pretty much there. It's it's something that out of data, and that gives you a guidance to move forward. All right. So let's let's talk about something that if you aggregated seven billion people on the planet, divided them by gender, and measured their height. you would observe that the average man is taller than the average woman that's probably as big as big data you can get is that an insight how many raise a show of hands is that an insight okay so those who are raising your hands explain why that is an insight anyone anyone who raised their hands why is that an insight <laughs> you didn't know that okay that's not your observation about the average male being taller than the average female <laughs> okay so that's an interesting part of it right if you're in a business where height matters that would matter as well yeah, but let me give you a completely different context uh, i was the brand manager for head and shoulders not in india in a different country and when you think about the average man being taller than the average woman you realize that the average man can actually see the top of a woman's head and so if a woman has dandruff the opposite gender is able to observe that uh, in any situation and suddenly that becomes a very compelling reason for a woman to consider addressing the dandruff problem so where a big data becomes an insight uh, and you just mr uh, you alluded to most of the elements so one part is it's something that is derived from a fact but the fact doesn't tell it itself there has to be something added to it so that it begins with a significant data or a fact then there is a, a significance drawn from it right? 
then there is an intuition added to it. You bring knowledge from outside of the world and then eventually it has to matter in the context that you're driving it so that it helps you grow your business or drive it forward or drives an action. Now, often I find in my interactions that you get deluged by charts, deluged by uh, a whole bunch of uh, you know, figures, etc. But what is missing is that single pinpointed element that tells you if you did the following, your business would grow. And so the first element in interaction I would say is, is it truly an insight? Yes, it would be if it includes those elements. It is more than just the data. There is intuition added to it. There is context added to it and it drives an action. So that would be my, my kind of first observation. The second one that I've come to recognize is who owns the insight? And I see too often, not just in my organization, but frankly in the broader marketing community where because of the responsibilities have grown because of many things we do, increasingly things get outsourced. And one of the things that gets outsourced is this business of insight. And what gets missed is the ability to join the dots. Uh, one of the projects I did uh, as an engineer was around Indian musical instruments. And you realize when you try and take something that we recognize naturally very easily and try and convert it to data, how difficult it is. Or think about describing a person you know very well. And then imagine giving that description to people and a bunch of photographs, will that person be recognized? It's very difficult, but we know that person instantly when we see it. So we have much more recognition uh, or recognizers of patterns than we are of individual data. Now that, that means that insights really come from people who see those multiple parts and bring it together. And often a business person looking at the data can think of more things than an agency or an external partner. So my view is that the, that ownership never goes away from the business person. And so just one example to illustrate this. We did a campaign recently where we had a callback number. So you see an ad, you call back the number and you take it forward. It was a fairly straightforward. Now, and one of the charts that come is, okay, where the call's coming from, which geography they're coming from, which product they're about, we got all those charts. But tucked away in those charts was a chart that showed actually how long after the ad the calls come. And we realized that most of the calls for an ad actually come within the first one hour. Now when we saw that, we said, you know what? We suddenly have the equivalent of click-through for television. So we put an ad on TV, if a call comes, we know that that ad was effective. And so we reverse engineered it. And so instead of looking at it as call volume, we said, okay, what do the calls say about the creative that was on TV and the channel we had chosen? And suddenly we had a, a measurement tool for traditional media. And that came not because the analytics agency figured this out. It was because a business person was looking at those charts with the business questions in their head and suddenly spotting a connection that would not be possible. So all the business people here, even if you happen to have outsourced analytics, I would say, look at those charts, look at the data because you will spot things that nobody else can. The third area I would say is overlaying the qualitative and the quantitative. So one of the divisions in Godrej is the agrovet business and which naturally deals with farmers. And so what is the simplest way that you uh, figure out the potential? Well, the size of the holding and the type of crop and you figure out what needs to be uh, contributed, you can figure out the potential. So that was pretty much the landscape. Then you add another set of big data to it. Okay, you have lots of salespeople going, you start keeping tracking of number of visits, etc. And you might start tracking, okay, how many visits it takes to convert somebody, so you have some ROI or a productivity measure. Okay, second level of big data. But what was lurking in that conversation was, why is it that with some farmers it takes less visits and with some farmers it takes more visits? And so getting into a qualitative conversation actually un uncovered types of farmers, including amongst the highest potential. And so there are farmers who, are, uh, who can play a big role in taking your product forward because they are respected or they have a point of view that carries forward. But even within that, we discovered there were two types. There are some who are very, very intellectually driven, results driven, who want the data, who want the test results or R&D results, and that will be the basis. There are quite others who have no interest in revenue, uh, data, knowledge, etc., but who want social stature. And so if you want to then make a sales productivity improve, it isn't just about demonstration, it isn't just about frequency, it is about mapping this qualitative information onto that data and saying, okay, I need to handle different farmers in different ways. And so that started changing our content and our manner of approach, which is well beyond data. The fourth one is there is a joy in the intellectualness of big data. And by God, do we love looking at, you know, what could be the most intellectual solution? And sometimes you can get quite surprised by how a very, very simple solution can trump the most intellectual one. So one of our divisions is Nature's Basket. It's a retail business in a few cities. And so it, there's a natural question that if we go into the next city, where should we open a store? Now, there are some cities we know very well, so we can decide fairly intuitively. So if you're opening in Bombay, yeah, it made sense. We open in Warden Road, Bandra, Juhu, Pawai, et cetera. Those made sense. So a lot could be done through intuition. But when you hit a city you don't know well, then you need some algorithm. 
So we said, okay, where could we look for algorithm? Okay, first big data source we thought of, okay, retail audit. Let's go talk to the retail audit people and let's see if we can find surrogates that we can map. So we did that, didn't make much sense. We overlaid some point of interest, didn't make sense, so we discarded that. Then we spoke to somebody who had more big data and they had a fair degree of economic information. They could tell you by per square kilometer in city what was the average income of the people there and they said, wow, this is far more precise. We went after that, we struggled with uh, it making sense and you suddenly realize the artificialness of this one square kilometer because in real life, a store is in a physical location. It may be just across a creek if you were thinking Bombay or across a big traffic point or not. They may be parking or they may not be parking. So suddenly that wasn't as helpful as we thought. We overlaid some other QS and other information, still no, no good. Then we went to mobile handsets. We said, okay, all this is not working. Maybe mobile handsets can overcome some of this issue. If we can pinpoint where those mobile handsets are in the night, we know where the, you know, the wealthier people are and maybe they'll sort. Again, nothing. And all these were paid activities and paid proof of concepts that we did. Finally, what solved it was actually a free activity. We found an online directory. I can't reveal what because that would give away the answer. But that online directory with an intern who manually wrote, wrote down a few things, we mapped that with our own intuition from Bombay, and that was far more accurate than any of those pieces. So sometimes the answer can lie in a version of the big data, but handled it differently. So the most intellectual need not be the best answer. Fifth, big data is actually not new, because big data has been around in the marketing world for as long as I can remember. Uh, for example, media has always been big data. How do you handle all these multiple channels, more than 200 channels, multiple languages? How do you make a media plan? You can't do it manually. It is big data. Uh, we used to have these huge UNA studies before. How would you manage that? Again, big data. What's changed is our ability to, first of all, not just get data that we've asked for, but even data we didn't ask for. And so the ability to discover things we didn't know before, as well as connect disparate parts of data, things that we wouldn't put it together, which means that you should be ready to be surprised. And therefore, be ready to completely change your views on life based on those connections. So I'll give you a couple of old world examples and then a new world example. So one of the companies I worked for, PepsiCo, had maintained consumption information for several years, in fact, spanning almost two decades. And the belief was that if you consume snacks heavily today, then the big growth opportunity lies in people who don't consume it heavily so that over time they will grow a uh, uh, consumption item. Well, what we discovered looking at 15, 20 years of data was the heavy guys became even more heavier and the light ones remain lighter. And that completely changed on our heads on how consumption grows. Second example from PNG days. We believe that, okay, once you achieve a certain level of penetration, then maybe bigger opportunity in growing frequency. Well, we mapped several initiatives over years and that big data told us that you can't grow them independently. An idea that makes somebody increase their usage also makes somebody who wasn't using it also use it. There's no barricading of those ideas. So invariably you will find both of those things grow together, not separately. Right? So both are very counterintuitive and changed uh, our worldview. But coming back to Nature's Basket, right? it's an international gourmet food store. Most of it is really, you know, uh, wines and, and international meats as a, uh, as, a, as a selling item, and that certainly forms a part of the basket. But when you start cutting the data, you suddenly realize that actually local fresh produce, which is fruits and vegetables, there is a segment which is coming only for that. Now, why would somebody come all the way to Nature's Basket, which is not your neighborhood store, to buy fruits and vegetables uh, and not any of the others? Well, it turns out the shopping experience. And so there is suddenly from a product centric, you have a consumer centric insight of people who want a certain kind of shopping experience. Then it doesn't matter what you put in there. They will come and pick it up. And so suddenly we're now thinking a little bit differently about what we have in that store. And finally, presentation matters. You can have all the big data in the world if it's not presented right you will not see it. And if you haven't seen it yet, I think the most stellar example of this is a talk given by Hans Rosling uh, on TED a few years back. Uh, it's now reached some 9, 10 million views. That's a brilliant example of when you present data in a certain fashion, the insights really jump out. So really those are my six. That true insight requires context, requires going more beyond facts and putting intuition, and it has to be useful to grow the business, only then it's an insight. Second, ownership must lie with the business owner who sees all the parts and is the best place to join the dots. Third, must always overlay the qualitative on the quantitative, otherwise you don't get a complete picture. Fourth, sometimes the most intellectual is not the right answer, sometimes simple can actually trump the intellectual. Five, be ready to be surprised. You will find connections that go completely in the face of your intuition and you should uh, be ready to accept that because that's the truth. And finally, 
presenting data matters. If you don't present it right, the insight won't pop. So like, those are my. Very interesting. Thanks, thanks, Shirish, for that. Okay. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I started my career with PNG in the same company as Shirish did, and so consumer goods, and then I went to retail, then I went to retail banking, and I found that the FMCG world was the most consumer centric. The retail world thought that the consumer was walking in every day was consumer centric, but not as much as the, as the FMCG world. And finally, the retail banking world, which thought that the consumer would never get away, so why be consumer centric, right? So interestingly, uh, I was reading an interview of Jeff Bezos, Amazon, the other day, and, and he mentioned that uh, in any important meeting that he conducts, uh, he keeps a seat vacant in the room, uh, and a seat is vacant because he wants that to be the customer. Uh, and, and so the focus of the customer, that obsession about the customer, is, is so critical, and you're finally using data to try and obsess about the customer and try and bring in the perspective that the customer brings to your business. And as retailers, many of you would be looking at gross margins and looking at them by inventory, by square foot, uh, by labor, but how many of you would look at gross margins per customer? So trying to bring in that, that, that orientation of what everyday decisions do I make, basis customer obsession, I think becomes a very critical piece. And to talk more about that, Rahul, Rahul is the CEO of Fortis Health World, and Rahul, you've been in the healthcare business for quite a while. Uh, regulated industry, tough business, consumer needs need to be met pretty urgently. Very, very different business. How do you see this whole aspect of being customer centric and using data effectively for your business? So I'll, I'll just give a quick context of uh, uh, you know, how we operate. We, we run about 100 stores, uh, so we're a small business, but nearly 80% of our revenues come from what we call prescription lines. Those are basically medicines that we actually provide to, to our customers. Uh, also to give you uh, two additional data points, uh, uh, we run two loyalty programs. One is called the Earn and Burn loyalty program, which is very similar to uh, people purchasing and gaining points and then burning them for purchases. Uh, and the other is a, is a senior citizen discount-led uh, program. Uh, nearly 65% uh, of our retail sales comes from our uh, loyalty business. Uh, if you look at our uh, transaction volumes, despite being such a small retailer, we still generate uh, nearly 60 to 70 gigabytes of transaction data every month, just to give you a sense as a small retailer. Uh, we have nearly uh, 20 million billing lines that go through our uh, POS counters. So this is just to give you a sense in terms of the, uh, the largeness of the data despite us being uh, a small retailer. And during the pre-discussion that I was having with the panel, I was just explaining to them as to the challenges that we actually face in terms of using this particular data effectively. Uh, we are 101 in terms of uh, data usage uh, at the present moment. Uh, we have uh, no business intelligence tool that we've actually uh, deployed. Uh, all we try and do is to uh, look at our transaction data, uh, take it into spreadsheets and try and see as to what sense we can make of it. Uh, the only thing that we actually do very effectively is to run a, a, a reminder service behind our, our uh, prescription customers to try and remind them to actually pick up their, their prescriptions on a, on a regular uh, basis. So that said, uh, you know, uh, about six months back, uh, we also seeded our e-commerce uh, business. It's called fortishealthworld.com, and some of you may want to just go and have a look at it, uh, only to realize that the, that the narrative of people who look at e-commerce marketing is entirely different to the narrative that we've been actually working with in the brick and mortar space. Uh, what we are now trying to do is to try and actually see whether we can kind of imbibe and learn from uh, people who do digital marketing uh, and try and see whether we can make some sense of that uh, in our offline world also. And the terms that they were using when they came to us and spoke to us about digital marketing was not very different from what we wanted. Yeah? Basically, they spoke about uniques, they spoke about 
average time on site, which is quite similar to you, you know the time that we would like the customer to spend in our uh, in our stores, uh, etc. Uh, so I was I I was just wanting to highlight the the complexity and and uh, challenges uh, uh, of that. So uh, you know we've been addressing it from a very generic level, but as soon as we've gone into the digital context, we've started understanding that you can look at it at a finer level. You can address customer segments at a, at a, at a finer level. Uh, and that's going to be a, a, a learning exercise uh, for us. Uh, the other thing that we are actually seeing uh, and is making it more exciting and more challenging is uh, what we are uh, uh, calling wearables. And I know uh, across the, the, uh, uh, the audience as well as people on the, on the panel, uh, have got wearables. Now, this is delivering connected, continuous, contextual data that is actually coming out. And uh, there are uh, communities that are using this particular data. There are obviously our customers who've got, got that particular data. And that's giving us another opportunity and another challenge to actually try and see as to what we can effectively make of uh, uh, that data. So, you know, we are, we are on, a, on a learning curve. We are open to, to learning. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, we are, we are trying to actually see how do we work with uh, uh, subject matter experts rather than try and do it ourselves uh, to actually ensure that we can uh, leverage it so that, you know, we can make this data and try and make it as consumer-centric as possible. The only last comment I would like to make is that I see that the challenge not only resides with small retailers like us, but resides with some of the larger players, larger uh, consumer-focused uh, uh, companies here. So, you know, I, uh, I, have, I happen to be a part of a loyalty program of one of the largest hotel groups. And every third day, I get, a, I get an email from them saying that, oh, they have a great property. Why don't you look at it? You haven't been here for so many days. You came last three years ago to Goa, why don't you actually come back again? Not realizing that I probably am frequenting the restaurants in their hotels maybe twice a month, but they never give me an indication in terms of what I could, what benefits I could get on the cuisine side and the restaurant side rather than the stay side. So I think the challenges uh, are there for everybody, more so for us because we are smaller, but we are learning, like I actually said. Thanks, thanks, Rahul. And I think it's interesting to note that even at this stage of your business, you're, you're beginning to see the value of data, and you're trying to see how you can ar architect that into your business. Okay. Yeah? Uh, interestingly, there's this whole space of economics called infonomics, which has come up lately. Anyone has heard of infonomics? So, you know, all of us know that in our own businesses, we value maybe IT hardware, we value everything. We even value our furniture in our balance sheets. But we don't value data, customer data. And this whole field of knowledge which is developing, which talks about saying that maybe we as companies should start to value our customer data and it has a place in your balance sheets and maybe when you start doing that, you'll, you'll start to see more uh, effectiveness of how you utilize it. So, uh, coming to Dallas. Uh, yep. Dallas, you're the uh, head of the Asia Pacific business for IBM. Uh, very interesting company, IBM. Just last week you bought three digital agencies. So are you a software company? Are you a hardware company? Are you an agency? What are you really? Today it's a big data company. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just to lead you into this, uh, you know, the whole, the whole concept of data, while it's glamorous, sounds interesting now, and big data has become so hyped, um, you work across industries. You see, you see players across different industries. Uh, do you find that this whole customer-centric approach that players might, ha might have, uh, are they investing behind it? Are they bringing the technology that they need to become more customer-centric, to analyze data, to even collect data to begin with? So, uh, I think, like Sarish said, big data has been around for a long time, right? So, it's, it's uh, from a retailer's perspective, all of you have been probably using the uh, annual retail surveys from various research agencies, which were used for various strategic insights and to take decisions. But in the context of that retail big data that was available at that point in time to today, is the ability to use that data in the context of much more, much shorter time frame. We didn't have to wait for a longer research to happen, three months of data collection, five months of you know, uh, cleansing and collating the data, and then finally deriving some insights with some intellectual sitting on that. Right? The ability to do that in a much more real-time fashion and to use that data in the context of personalizing the customer experience is what is possible with technology today. So in that sense, while big data existed, the ability to use the data in a much more you know, real-time fashion is what makes the you know, uh, 
entire technology sense in that sense very exciting right now it is also changing business models right it's also bringing new things in terms of what customers are trying to do uh, maybe I'll, I'll take a few examples here um, uh, let's start with Walmart you know the largest retailer in the world right so uh, no retail conversation is ever completed without talking about Walmart now uh, 11,000 stores uh, uh, I think 200 million odd customers uh, they generate about 2.5 petabytes of data right some of you will understand that petabyte stands for how many zeros but you can google that uh, now uh, at the same time you know they are they are a company which actually is very focused on trying to find out what can I do in my store so that I can increase my sales they're very focused on every store being profitable you know the in, the, in what they store in a particular uh, what inventory they keep in a particular store in what neighborhood uh, so they started investigating new trends right and this was about uh, weather data right now you can imagine uh, by the way IBM bought weather company uh, about a, about a month back uh, some of you would wonder what is weather company doing in IBM but the story will probably tell you some insights into what what is what is big data doing in today's world uh, so they actually went about uh, an exercise to link uh, the sales of some uh, fresh goods in the store uh, and they wanted to figure out what impacts what right uh, what weather impacts what trend in the in the store so wind speed right so I had a great impact on three categories of stuff right for example if the wind was low wind right in a particular area if it was a low wind day, uh, low wind time in a particular area the sale of berries went up right low wind uh, uh, normal temperature the sale of berries went up so they actually started storing more berries depending on the weather forecast data and actually the berry sales went up for the stores by three times. Our speaker booklet and we've got our time to our schedule. You have two alphanumeric codes at the side of the names of each speaker. Uh, it is the code number that leads to one of our partner stalls. Visit the stall. The first three each hour will get a lucky prize. In your program handbook, we've got some sort of a passport at the end, which will help you visit and experience everything we have here at Retail Leadership Summit. So when you visit our partner stall, make sure you get it stamped. And once you've completed the entire passport, all the pages, all the slots are full, collect your prize or a gift from our registration counter. Please join the Twitter contest. We'll be sending you questions on at the rate of Rai underscore India. The first three to answer each question correctly will also win prizes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Flipkart will be conducting an exclusive workshop by invitation only. It is your business hour with Flipkart. Invitations have already been sent out uh, on mail, on SMS. Please note that all those of you who have received that invite should be at the Jasmine Room right down the corridor at 3 p.m. for this exclusive by invitation only workshop, courtesy Flipkart. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from lunch. We hope you're all fueled up and... You know, think about interlinking data points, which is not just here, but uh, outside. Uh, they said, okay, if it's low wind, what about uh, high wind? They said, okay, fair enough. On a high wind situation, but with normal temperature, uh, the sale of steaks went up. Right? So they, they linked that data and started storing steaks in the stores, depending on the weather forecast and what the windy condition, wind conditions are going to be. And the third one is, of course, uh, the shredded meat, which they said if it was high wind and high temperature, uh, it's normal meat that sells better, right? So a perfect example of how you, are, you brought in, a con you know, the data that sat inside the organization, data that sat outside, available real time because there's a lot of weather forecasting that's happened, which is very real time, and how they could, you know, impact directly their business, right? So that's one Walmart example. I'll, I'll give you a second one, which is uh, in the context of you know, IBM, we talk about cognitivity nowadays, uh, which is around making computers human. Uh, so we want them to behave like us, talk like us, think like us. So uh, not the zero one paradigm, but actually the gray paradigm in between, right? We're wanting computers to become fractions and probabilistic. Uh, uh, with, and if there are computer engineers here, they will understand that this is not what computers have ever been designed for or programmed for. They're always zero or one. You tell them if, and then it will do you know then right so it, it is an if then equation always in computer science 
but that's changing uh, and that's changing in the sense that you make the computer learn and then it starts you know guessing uh, it starts probabilizing stuff right now and it learns actively now there's a new company which has started now think about uh, toys right now there's, there's a new to company which has just got launched uh, on the basis of that what they did was they used the power of uh, the cognitive system that IBM has built and it's a toy which you can give to, give to a child and as the child interacts the toy learns the preferences of the style of speech of that particular child and it starts interacting and as the child grows the, the toy also learns new things and starts interacting with the child right so it's a toy which you don't you know shed away zero to three years it's something that stays with the child as the style grows from its you know infant years when it starts inter interacting and making noises the the toy would make you know colors and noises and lights which would excite a baby to as the child is growing up in terms of answering questions right so that's that's the kind of power that you can actually bring in uh, in a completely business which nobody would ever think of right so it's a big data business in reality but it's a simple toy right so so there's an impact of in business models and how data can get consumed and change uh, business models itself right thanks thanks Dallas so interestingly, uh, we at Security, we work across industries, automobile, retail, banking, financial services. And me as a consumer, often when I uh, you know, interact with, uh, with companies, I find that now you don't benchmark your own industry. So you don't say if I'm a retailer, I will benchmark only the other department store or the other grocery store. Because today, if I use Uber, and I, I like that app, I find it very consumer friendly, I benchmark the taxi or the transportation industry with the same simplicity I want in my retail or in anything else. So consumers, their whole, their whole expectations of what they expect as customer service is changing completely uh, from, a, from a situation where consumers were all right with monologue, where, where you would speak uh, as a company, as a marketer, you would speak with consumers. Now there is dialogue and everybody has a social megaphone with social media and all of that. Yeah. So bringing in Anurag, Anurag, you've uh, obviously shared a lot of information with us about the retail business, but you do see multiple industries and you do see retail very closely. Uh, customer service standards are changing, they're getting disrupted. Big data has a role to play in this uh, from the perspective of bringing the right data and the interesting point Shirish made, the right connections of data. At the point of consumption, when we as consumers are interacting with retailers, would you like to share some examples of how you think big data can impact the business? Absolutely. I think, I think you make a very relevant point that you know, the service expectations, the consumer expectations per se are not being driven by one industry. I think the, the time when uh, it was gone, you can say that you know, in my industry, nobody is doing this, so I don't need to do it. You know, today in a consumer's life, if, if you know, he can book train tickets online, which is was probably the toughest thing he had to do in his travel world if he can get you know he, he can write on our Tata Sky Twitter feed and get a service person to come to his house in two hours then he expects you know across businesses be it a retail business if he go, goes home find a problem with the product and writes on your Facebook feed or XYZ he expects a response in two hours or he expects a response in a couple of hours he, he's not willing to wait two days or three days to say that we look at it and you know there is uh, nobody talking to it about it or, or you know across businesses and just incidentally from this level, you know, talking about big data and how companies are using it, uh, you know, I always talk about this many times that, you know, Tata Sky has this major Twitter feed that where you put in and you put up a request and they respond to you in two hours and uh, there is a great uh, kind of response. And I was talking to it about uh, this to somebody and uh, they came up, came up and tell me that they actually went up, put up on the Tata Sky Twitter feed to say that, uh, you know, can we, they wanted to get a new set of box installation and uh, went to and wrote there and prompt within one hour they got a call from Airtel saying we're willing to give a 50% discount can you do it so there is somebody you know so it is much broader than just your own data as well so I think there's intention in your data yeah, the intention is very clear so I think the I think the point that Shirish made as well as you know it's been uh, Rahul made you know earlier the whole idea is to say that you have to use data to be solving business problems and I think that's where the fundamental of it lies I mean when we look at and you meant you spoke about industries, you know, telecom and financial services, uh, aviation really has had the extent of data for a very, very long time. And, you know, they are possibly, I would say, from a technology standpoint or infrastructure standpoint, significantly more advanced than other industries in terms of what they have for using for analytics. Our, what I, what I see missing in some form or shape across businesses, or I would say is growing, 
is uh, the whole desire to generate insights. You know, companies are willing to invest uh, behind data and infrastructure a much larger time and effort and resources than they are willing to invest business people to use those insights for. And uh, you know, to this point earlier, I think critically that is where uh, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, come out. And uh, interest me, we were working for uh, you know, an FMCG company looking at sales patterns for a salesperson and uh, seeing that you know some sales you know, everybody in the FMCG business a lot of people put in uh, you know distributed management systems sales force systems they have a fair amount of data going for the last four or five years these larger companies and uh, are have been trying to look at saying that you know where does my salesperson go can I get a pattern can I get a retail companies also on the business development side more cash and carry getting a sense of where does my retail person go what does he do all day how much time is he spending on field etc and so, there was data emerging in terms of saying that you know different people are stopping at different times of the day. Somebody spends two hours in the market, three hours in the market. FMCG has a fair amount of beat cut out in terms of you know 45 outlets to be done. These number of uh, these many somebody stops at 25, somebody stops at 35, somebody's you know going all the way to 45. So really trying to get why, what, how, and everybody sort of uh, built their intuitions around why it would be happening. Somebody said, give them a mobile, the guys who are walking, you know, they're taking too much time. This guy starts near their home and, you know, start. So it is about, but when you spend the time of, so you, they had all the data generated, but when you spend the time, you realize a very simple pattern that emerged that salespeople could look at and say, when this guy completes the target, he goes home. You know, that's it for the day. Whether he does it 20 outlets, 35 outlets or 18 outlets, you know, he'll get there, do two, three, four, five more to make sure the big guys are covered and that's it, he'll go home after that. Which is uh, again, you know, coming on uh, building in terms of saying that yes, there is a lot of data available, but are the right people spending time on their data to really derive the insights and uh, think about a lot of this. I think to my mind that is what can, you know, Interesting. pull yeah. the power out for it. Uh, absolutely. You know, the other thought which I had was that, you know, if you look at it, the e-commerce or the online or the new age companies, uh, they tend to be looking at data far more than, than other uh, brick, brick and mortar industries. And is there some aspect of this to do with really the, uh, the you know, established attitude towards how you do business? I, I don't know how many of you have heard of a company called True and Company. Any hands up for True and Company? It's very interesting. It's, it's an online lingerie company uh, promoted by a woman. And uh, the, the, the need gap that she saw in the market was that she said that the whole lingerie buying process is broken. And, and women have a hard time finding, finding laundry and finding the fit. And she created a company called True and Company, which is predicated completely on data. So when a woman logs into this, to this app, uh, there's a whole range of surveys and simple questions that, that cue the consumer to give data about herself, uh, which finally run on algorithms at the back end and produce uh, uh, the, the right product for the customer. So this is really to bring in Sanjeev. Sanjeev, you run a very interesting uh, big data company. You work with retailers, and interestingly, you're a banker before that. So, you know, looking at True and Company and looking at the kind of intelligence that they've used, uh, have you experience with your clients or with industries or companies where they are beginning to use this kind of deep algorithmic look and insight from the customers? Sure. Um, so, thanks. So, yeah, I mean, we run a big data company where we're monitoring about 850 million products across 1,100 different categories. 170,000 brands every single day. About a petabyte of data, incremental a petabyte of data every single month, and you know, to bring it back into insights. I think in bringing the consumer back into the focus, you know, if the consumer has gone sec channel agnostic, I think, and if omni-channel is something that every retailer and brand and is, is focusing on, I think that's just hygiene. It's not innovation anymore. You know, to, able, to be able to recognize the cons consumer, whether they come on your mobile app or um, to your website or in store, as well as linking your inventories in the background are just hygiene. I think what you do with that consumer data afterwards, how they're discovering product, uh, product, how they're going through the selection process, what are they adding to the basket, affinities between products in the basket, price points that they convert at, uh, all those things coming back is, is super insightful. I mean, Twin Company is one example, Adore Me um, out of the US, another lingerie company that wanted to break the myth around lingerie that blondes uh, and super fit models are the best way to advertise lingerie. They actually tried it with real size women and all different sort of kind of brunettes versus blondes. And the results that came back was real women advertising lingerie had much higher click through rates as well as conversion sales than, than the perfect models. Um, same way, converting it back into merchandising insights, colors that sell the best, um, sizes that sell the best, a combination of those to reduce your inventory carriage, 
are the kind of insights we should look at and not just the top of the funnel. I think what currently the focus for a lot of online, offline retailers is just on the top of the funnel to use data. You know, how do you attract more customers to walk into your storefront or your desktop website or your mobile app? It's what you do after. Do you tweak your designs based on what the footprint consumers left behind? Do you tweak your sizes? Do you tweak your price points? And you know, we've spoken about the whole price point and the price war all day. And even the millennials who've gone brand agnostic, loyalty is going down, uh, they're ready to compare prices while in store using the store's own Wi-Fi. I think they still perceive value in experience, in the store assistant having better knowledge of the product itself, uh, in somebody being able to make an offer, and by offer I don't just mean a discount, cross-sell, upsell. You bought this, would you like to buy that? Uh, while they're in store, and not once the consumer leaves and you're targeting them with emails or retargeting ads or, or whatever you want to do. And I think that's the power of big data. When you can connect merchandising, marketing, supply chain, consumer experience all together and make, make a decision that impacts the entire retail life cycle is when big data really comes, to, comes into power. Have you seen examples of online companies making such decisions on a day-to-day -day basis using your algorithms? Uh, and, and do you think there's a difference for the online companies versus the brick and mortar? I'd say that it's, it's shrinking. Uh, it's shrinking a lot, but yes, e-commerce has been early adopters. I mean, to give you fashion examples, I mean, rather than people going and saying that, here's been my sell-through, this is the kind of inventory I sit on for this particular product, what should I price it at? And then the best they would probably go on to saying is, if I'm going to take a promo discount, the sales velocity that increases, how does that lead to an out-of-stock situation in a fashion, fashion example? How we've taken that forward is actually going and asking, what is this product that you're taking a discount on? Um, imagine it's a white shirt, Vince collar, French cuffs, made of cotton, slim fit. Now, how many such shirts exist? And I think that's bringing in global data. And then other things you said about, you know, industry linkages. We actually look at category linkages. The neon shoe went viral across everywhere. Is that neon color going to translate back into apparel at some point? There are lead linkages. Will that go into curtains and carpets at some point? That's home decor. Will that finally convert into the uh, uh, electronic accessories, the back cover of a mobile phone? That's the lead example. And I think there's a lot of those dependencies uh, that I think a lot of, lot of companies are now beginning to use for, for predicting stuff. I think a reactive strategy is, is always dangerous, but I think that's what everyone's doing. It's predictively being able to understand that sentiment before it occurs, and making merchandising and pricing calls at the back of it is a much smarter way to run a business. Yeah, so, so the, uh, I'm just picking up on that particular point. You know, while uh, you know, the, the, the point about omnichannel has actually been echoed uh, right across uh, the panels, one needs to understand the reality of context in which uh, retailers are operating. You know, a lot of them have legacy systems. They are working in low margin environments. To make changes that quickly sometimes is difficult and very, very challenging. And sometimes it requires investments which are far more than uh, they have the appetite for that particular uh, uh, moment. So, so while I completely agree that that is the customer experience that you would want to give, uh, you know, you have to be mindful of, of the fact that it's a going concern and you're actually dealing with real business decisions on a day-to-day on a -day basis. The other point I'd just like to make and again echo uh, to the report that Anurag put up and there were uh, two very specific points or one specific point that came out which basically said that consumer experience is linked to the uh, moment of truth. And the moment of truth is, especially from a brick and mortar retailer, is the experience that he actually has on the shop floor. And you can do as much as you want with the data. If you don't have the right people, the right trained people, that is not going to give you the dividends that you're actually looking for. So, so those Very interesting, things. absolutely. Just so, switching the topic. I'll just to add add to, I wanted to add to that. Essentially, um, uh, what, if I had to simplify this uh, in the IT jargon, right? So essentially, it's the ability to take decisions. Uh, be it, so as a consumer uh, and from a customer experience perspective, if I can give him a data point or an insight that helps him decide easier and where he feels, maybe it could be a marketing message, but if it feels to him like a service, right, that's, that insight is a useful insight and a useful service. Very similarly, within organizations, uh, while the data and insight is there, uh, and that insight, if it's available to your merchandiser to make a decision, uh, and take that, take those calls. Your store, your you know store manager. If he can take those calls based on the insights that he gets, that would that is where they can make it impactful on the customer service. 
So there I think one other area while you know there is this thing about uh, yeah it's, it's, it's a difficult journey to get there but the more important one is actually the cultural shift about taking those decisions in, within organizations. A lot of times there's a lot of insight that is available but culturally we as organizations don't empower our people to take those calls because or trust the data right so we still want to trust the hierarchy versus trust the data. So I think it's, the, it's a culture that will evolve, right? It's, it's as people see more data, as people start generating more data and, that gener and, and the visibility of the data in terms of impacting what happens, you will empower and take those decisions and trust the data and move forward. And that's probably a cultural shift which will happen in the next few years. Right? Absolutely, I think that's critical. That's the point I was coming to. You know, if you look at it, analytics has been around for a while now. Big data came by a few years back, became such an inflated thing. But in reality, if you look at, go back and look at analytics itself, there aren't that many companies which have competed very differently based on analytics. Exactly. You have maybe Capital One, you have Harass Casino, you have a few examples. We don't have that many companies. So my question, Shirish, really was that from your experience of having worked with a company, which both of us know we started with that company, was so data-centric, Procter & Gamble. Uh, are there some fundamental truths to the way you do business, to the way you constitute teams, the processes that you run, the way you take decisions, which really are the bedrock of being able to use data leave alone big data? So I think it, it, it's a mix of many things. Uh, it's a mix of, first of all, understanding what business you're in. Uh, and because that allows you to draw the right connection. So yes, it's one thing to look at the products you're making and a slightly different uh, conversation as to what business you're in. So that, that's one part of it. Second is understanding where your, uh, uh, where your customers uh, are today uh, in terms of how they look at options, how they interact with you. Uh, and what else is in the neighborhood of a similar solution. So, for example, when you ask a question, you know, you're in the business of, let's say, making bathroom cleaners, and you say, okay, for my comparison, it is bathroom cleaners, and so let's look at, you know, active levels and cleaning rates and prices and sizes and whatever, disposability, et cetera, and that becomes a set. Now, consumers are not interested, actually, in bathroom cleaners. They're interested in clean bathrooms, right? And so you say, okay, what do I have to do to identify clean bathrooms? And suddenly, you say, okay, maybe I need to not just make cleaners, I need to make tiles because some tiles maybe don't need cleaners. Right. Right? So I think for any business, it is to first understand what business you're in. You have to understand from a consumer's view, uh, what is it that the, the true need that they're uh, looking for and where do you fit into that process. So too often I see marketers and organizations saying, okay, this is what we make, how do we get people interested in this, which is true and, and you need to do that. But I think if you really want to leverage data to its full extent, especially what big data offers, it offers you the unique ability to look beyond what you might have thought of asking. Uh, and so I think the opportunity lies in really going open-minded, uh, looking at through your own lenses, interacting, and trying to see where connect, is it those boundaries the lie. Right. I, I, but not just the dots. Where do the boundaries lie? Because you have to also, you can't be deluded by, uh, deluged by dots and say, okay, now what do I join here? Right? Uh, so I think the heart of it, uh, and that was true even when, we, uh, when you think back to uh, PNG days where you understood not just a specific offering, but you thought in much broader set. In those days, that broader set used to be the UNA. Right. You looked right. at a broader set of things and you figured out, and so an anti lice shampoo in a bottle could compete with a lice comb. And why? Because you were thinking in much broader terms. So that principle is valid even today. So I think the broader you think, but connected, so you can broader think of, perspective, but yeah, but broader cannot be random as well. Right? So as long as it is connected, I think that's the heart of getting sure. it right. That's important. Yeah, uh, so uh, I just wanted to make a point in terms of uh, looking at it from a, a consumer goods or an FMCG company. And you know, we have these reviews at semi-annually with, with, with the companies uh, where we have key account relationships. Uh, they come in and they present to us on consumer insights and new products that they're going to actually launch. Uh, we present to them in terms of what kind of order fills that we are actually receiving. Yeah? And till such time as the uh, companies can get their mind around to the fact that the last mile has to be good because till such time as that actually happens, it's very unlikely that you'll be able to you know, get a, get a consumer-centric approach truly. And I think that's where data, big data, kind of tends to get evolved and starts moving across boundaries from, from retail to consumer goods companies so that you can actually have a more, a better kind of consumer experience truly.
So you know, so it's not only about uh, using consumer insights to to evolve great products. It's also that particular last mile, and that's that's what we always uh, tell the consumer goods companies that we when we actually discuss. Well, Don, from your perspective, uh, is, are there things, are there changes in attitude at the front end, at the ground level, where people tend to maybe take more decisions, decisions using intuition right. rather than data, and and therefore is there some so, change which you need? So you know, so so principally over the last four years that we've had the discussions with them. Uh, the only point that they've actually submitted to us is there is a forecasting error. You know, and forecasting errors, if you look at it purely, I'm not a great statistician, but I would, I would imagine that forecasting errors would tend to get addressed, you know, once they've actually occurred. Uh, so obviously there is some, either some snowballing effect that is actually there uh, and forecast errors are causing them to, or they're principally looking at the big box formats or the e-commerce people are influencing it, but the last mile is getting affected, yeah? And modern trade is getting affected. So it's not only us. I'm sure if you were to talk to the big bazaars of the world, they'll also tell you the same thing. Yep. And I think to your point on impacting the last mile and, and to your point, is it being passed on to the absolute person on the storefront itself? You know, big data is again a very abused word, just as only channel. I think it's, it's about the quick insight itself, as you said, an actionable insight. You know, every store person feels threatened with more technology coming in. Does it make me redundant? And actually, if you use that technology to empower them, you know, um, Steve Jobs said in 98, you know, people often don't know what they want till, till you actually show it to them. I think 16 years fast forward, that's completely changed. Consumers walk into a store having done their research, information's freely available, they know exactly what they're looking for. And store assistants constantly feel cha uh, challenged that they, they can't meet up to that. And just simple technology, which is an app which could scan a product and give you all the product description, similar products available, price comparisons, all those kind of things are very simple tools to empower them a plug-in into the POS solution itself. You know, you've seen that at Starbucks and other places where you order a coffee, do you want chocolate on top of it, do you want this syrup, do you want that? It doesn't increase the checkout process by that much. But where do you see it in other categories? You just bought the blue trousers, do you want a white shirt with it, a brown belt with it? You know, those kind of recommendations can just increase basket size dramatically. And that's empowering those people to not just increase, sort of fulfill their own, own targets, but that's building a use, unique experience offline as well. All those things that you can do online can be done offline. And, and that experience can be replicated through technology, which is not big data, which are very simple insights picked from whatever you understand from a large chunk of consumer data. Right. So, so really what you're saying is that apart from big data, there's also this small data, yeah. which, and Shirish, what you mentioned, that connecting, not the dots, but getting the boundaries in and making the connection with the business and what it is that the consumer is saying really becomes critical. So Dhanush, I can add to that in terms of, you know, just not, the, I would say not, not just giving them insight, looking back to their insights as well. I mean, so remember, most of our organized retail business is competing with the mom and pop stores, right? And you're competing with a person who has local insight. It is a local business. It is a single store business. You know, retail, a bit unlike I've seen in former shape. There is, uh, you know, local assortment. Local. There, there is a local, very local need. And you know, your neighborhood retailer is the guy who understands that. I'll give you two sort of different but connected examples to sort of uh, put that out. And I take examples several times. You know. I was speaking to a local retailer, mom and pop guy, Bajrangi Bhajan got launched, the guy came up, put out keychains with lockets out there, you know, talking to a few consumers, and he managed to sell like 8 lakhs worth of keychains in 3 weeks. And, you know, he had some left, he went to an online site, sold them all back again somewhere to other consumers. But the fact is that, you know, the guy next to him, on an organized retail site, would it even be possible to get uh, local assortment in place? Would there be insight available from the local front that is taken back and put back? You know, on the other hand, I, I see some of the, you know, every time Halloween comes near my house, there are a couple of retailers who will pick up and get lots of stuff and there it'll be, and the organized retail guys in the same locality sort of struggle to say we don't have anything because, you know, it's not a large enough phenomena, it's not everywhere, we don't really, it's not an assortment that's uh, meaningful in a large way. But at the same time, locally, it's very meaningful and can generate, you know, a very large amount of uh, sales for that same store sales. So the question is that how do you bring some of these local insights and, you know, local uh, yeah, into uh, a more meaningful manner and also empower your store managers? I mean, be it store managers, be it the local store person has to have, you know, because a lot of the data analysis, a lot of the insighting, a lot of the analytics, big data is done centrally on large servers with, you know, central people looking at it. But how do you, you say, enable both, empower the store manager locally to be able to take action upon it, train him, and to be able to hear back from him in some form or shape because, you know, that is a large form of insight. And as more and more qualitative 
analytics, social analytics gets built into these, it will become more and more local in nature. And how do you sort of sure, a company sure. build towards that? That is a quick question around, uh, you know, when IBM goes in and you talk to large retailers or other companies, uh, you are talking about fairly large investments in technology, right? And uh, so do you see the customer being in the boardroom and is the board of the company looking at in a, so many enabling technologies which will finally impact the customer experience? Yeah. And are you beginning to see a change in that in India and Asia Pacific where you, where you operate? Uh, absolutely, All right? And I'll probably start with an anecdote. Uh, uh, there is an investment company in Hong Kong which actually has a Watson system in the board, right? The, so it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a board of, it's a investment company which has a board um, and in that they've actually kept this com cognitive computing system as a board member to validate the discussion that's happening in a board meeting and to give insights which may not be there in that, you know, human system. Fundamentally, you know, human mind has a certain amount of capability to compute and to express. But a compute system, if you, if you teach it, it can do that same thing and do that much better, right? So it never replaces, but it can assist. So in that sense, yeah, it's already in the boardroom. But coming back to your question, uh, uh, and I'll take an example. This is one of the iconic brands out of India, uh, and this was a discussion as of yesterday. Uh, uh, in, they just recently appointed a chief digital officer uh, as an organization. The MD and the CFO, uh, are, are concerned, they're a retailer, they're, uh, they're a manufacturing organization, it's a back-ended retailer, very concerned about the fact that the e-commerce players, people who come in, they're disrupting their business, right? So they've had 18 months of struggle, uh, but at the same time, they still have a very strong brand equation in the market. Now, uh, fundamentally, uh, at the board level, at the CFO level, and the, and the uh, MD level, they're very clear that they need to do something which is very different and change the culture of the organization in terms of how they use data, right? Uh, but as a, as a culture, they have, had, they have had these federated businesses which always did what they did, you know, in the brick and mortar world, right? So they've become market leaders. And then there's this constant tussle going on in terms of the, what the board wants to achieve vis-a-vis -vis the investors and the you know, accountability of the shareholders. On the other hand, the brands which want to do stuff which is around the consumer. So that's a struggle. But at the same time, they clearly realize that if they continue the way they do, this is not going, you know, the businesses are resisting the change because they are comfortable in what they do. But at the board level, it's a completely different conversation. If we are missing the consumer in this entire space without data and without analytics, uh, they, they know that in, in five years down the line, that company will struggle. So they actually brought in this new role called a digital officer, uh, and that job is to bring that consensus around the use of analytics and data in the way they operate, right? So it's a, so it's, it is, and I, this is, I, I can tell you, one of the iconic brands out of India, right? Made in India brand, uh, iconic company. But going through the same struggle, and I'm sure every single you know, company, extremely successful companies, but they are all threatened by it, and their board and uh, the senior leadership in most of these companies are today waking up to the fact that yes, there is a need for a change. Yes, there is a need for how we look at the consumer because the consumer is pushing us. He knows a lot more about us and there is another set of players who are satisfying the consumer differently. Right? So if we don't do that change uh, and adopt to the new world, we will, we will struggle. So Anurag, with companies investing so much in analytics and big data, uh, expectations are also sky high, right? Yes. Uh, it almost sounds like a magic wand or a magic pill and then, you know, in a slow growing market, just bring in some big data and that's your solution. So how in your experience do companies manage this kind of transformation and change and yet set the expectations where they belong and the cultural change that Dallas was speaking about, how do they bring it in? So I think uh, the ones who have successfully managed this or are successfully managing it in uh, some form or shape are the ones who are sort of starting from solving a problem. I think not starting with investing in technology infrastructure upwards. Yeah. You know, they are looking at it from the back forward saying that, you know, we could be get doing, you know, we could be doing our storefront much better. We could be doing our windows much better. We could be putting our merchandising much better. We could be, you know, and trying 
working backwards to solve for those problems and saying where is the data where we you know the example you took about placing a new store I mean, we are working with a company working with looking at electronic data you know electronic means sorry electricity data in terms of saying that electricity consumption patterns can help you get to put to where your store is or where your cart is or where you know uh, things like that to as proxies of income and really but that all of those there is a lot of data or types of data that you could get or build towards when you start by thinking from a problem and how to solve you know get at it and uh, solve towards it so I think that is to me the core of uh, how the successful companies are doing and second I think uh, much like you know whether be it digital disruption itself or be it uh, some of the analytics pieces it has to be looked at uh, from the top as a business solution it has to have an ROI it has to you know the operating model or the the way the company thinks about how it percolates downwards uh, you know there has to be a clear line of uh, stream right to the front in terms of saying who's going to use this data how's going to go it's not just about generating the data and building it great who's going to use that insight on a regular basis who's going to take the action on it who's going to be accountable for that action and you know building back towards it and having a clear pipeline towards that I think those two are the to sure. me the distinguishing factors of somebody's using it well great so I think it's been a great discussion uh, I think we've covered a lot of ground I think yes big data is hype but I think we've seen examples of where data as well as big data can be effectively used in business uh, hopefully companies learn to make the cultural transformation required Dallas like how you mentioned be able to implement big data effectively yes. and companies learn to value their data to be able to actually start making those investments. Uh, maybe we have a minute or so for questions or are we out of time? Maybe a few questions? Yeah. Uh, we'll have to forego the questions. We are out of time, sir. There is one okay. over there. We can take them offline if required. Can we take one? There's Just one. Take a one okay, one question. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Is my thinking sort of wrong in terms of when we talk about big data are we really focusing on on say organized retail because I can understand the story of Walmarts and, and Tesco club cards and all that because you know the proportion of um, organized retail compared to unorganized retail is as far you know the, the, the equation is wrong in terms of India you have inverse equation where you have 80 85 percent of re hello could, hear you. No. Yeah. Could, could catch your question, we, we could could catch your question. question. oh sorry um, so my question is when we talk about big data are we really talking about organized retail um, because we do lack you know um, basic data points for retail in India if I was talking about a, a local Karyana guy you know who's got a, a small uh, wooden box for his cash register and, and a calculator so I understand you know big data coming out from from US and UK and all these countries but in India how do we tackle that part because you know 85 percent of the retail happens you know in an uh, unorganized uh, uh, way so what are the data points in terms of you know when we're talking about really understanding the data of, of a consumer behavior in, in a even look um, in, in a given location Sorry, is, the, is, the, the, is the question that is big data applicable in Indian context yeah is that the question yeah so is it really applicable for unorganized sector because we're unorganized. Unorganized. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think I think data is is relevant to any type of uh, retail whether it's organized or unorganized now the bigger challenges that unorganized retail would face is in terms of how do they make that particular data a bit more formal and try and see what they can actually do with it uh, if small retailers are like ourselves are not being able to get our minds around the data that we actually carry and we are looking for external help to try and see what we can do with that simply because we don't carry the competencies in house I think uh, it could definitely be a, a, a business proposition uh, for some people to try and actually see whether they can actually take it down to that particular micro level and help those small retailers uh, with the data they actually carry and it becomes very pertinent because uh, all the small retailers and it's you know as I see it uh, going forward it's highly unlikely that you're going to actually see mushrooming of reasonably sized uh, new uh, unorganized players the entrenched unorganized players are going to be in increasingly saturated or declining markets so they actually have to use that particular data quite effectively to ensure that they can at least keep their heads above water yeah so I think it, it it's it's relevant the only thing is how do you formalize that particular data 
and uh, who do you kind of reach out to to actually ensure that it gets used effectively? So today, in the, today's world, in the context of uh, inside economy, right, uh, that data and insight is actually available for anyone to consume, organized or not, unorganized. You don't need to make those big ticket investments to be able to use those insights. So an unorganized retail can be made efficient with that entire supply chain that goes along with it. If the CPG company which supplies to the retailer can provide an insight which can make it better. So you can collect data from him which can make the CPG company uh, you know, take the data and make uh, more consumer-centric decisions, right? So, so the inside economy world today is, perfect, is, is the perfect world in terms of it impacting both the sides. A quick uh, observation on that. I think so. We we did this very large project for Unilever where they were trying to bring unorganized retailers to organized retail, and they went and installed POS solutions everywhere, zero adoption. They just didn't want to touch it, and that's where sort of we came in and said again they felt threatened with that. So you need to empower them. So, so we actually built POS plugins, which would guide them. It's Monday morning, move Dove to the front and pay us to the bank, both luxury soaps. Don't take a discount mid-month. It's a seasonal product. It's doing well anyway. And you know, when they see their margins and sales go up, store layouts, they're very tiny display space. How do you optimize that space? Tiny store warehouses, how much do you stock? Those kind of insights coming back are invaluable. The second side to it is, and we have a product that's ridiculously cheap, and we, we take it to unorganized guys who do not even collect sales data. So what am I going to do my pricing forecasting on? What am I going to do my demand forecasting on? That's where, looking at those 850 million products, we bring in insights on what's happening for similar identical products across the organized sector back to them, saying, here are your insights. Better start capturing sales data so it improves, because your consumer base is very different from where we're bringing this from. It's a global database. But at least there's a start point. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your comments. It was a great panel.